This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Today on CityCast Houston, is the city one step closer to paying a fee for an essential service? Plus, which former mayor is coming for Lena Hidalgo's job? And an iconic store that helps so many of us is closing down. Houston Chronicle columnist Joy Sewing and Pulitzer Prize finalist Evan Mintz join me to recap the news from the week. It's Friday, May 3rd. I'm Raheel Ramzan Ali, and here's what Houston's talking about. Good morning, Evan. Good morning, Joy. How's everybody doing? Great. Thank you. I'm doing wonderfully. How are you? I'm doing great. It's been a wet week here in the city of Houston and surrounding areas, but we are officially in May. We published our guide to the city for the month of May. So I want to start by asking both of y'all, what is one thing you have to do this month? Joy? Everything that I can't get done in July, August, September, October, because it's too hot. (laughs) How about that? That's perfect. Give me one example. Clean my garage. How about that? Ooh. Okay. You got to clean the garage in May. Absolutely. A little spring cleaning. How about you, Evan? Oh, man. This is the first month where you get down to Galveston. Take that first Galveston trip of the year. Though for me, May means harvesting tomatoes. You've heard me ranting about my gardening all year long. Now I finally get to reap the benefits. Nice. I love it. Uh, I'm waiting for my uh, crop. All right. You got to send me some. Oh, definitely. Well, let's get to our biggest story of the week. Joy, what was your biggest story? There have been a series of shootings in Third Ward area, and the crime rate has increased. As we know, Um, HPD Chief Troy Finner came to our neighborhood and had a community meeting with about 100 uh, uh, pretty hot uh, residents. And he did even a a walkthrough uh, down Emancipation Park on Saturday night around 10, 30, 11, uh, just to kind of get a understanding of what's going on. We are kind of sandwiched by these little nightclubs that sometimes operate um, legally, sometimes don't. They have limited parking that spills into the neighborhood and bring a lot of traffic and people who don't live in the neighborhood. And some of them are, are great. And then some of them, you know, are bad actors. So he has said that he is dedicating um, more police enforcement in our area. So we are hopeful that that will pan out um, because we need it. Yeah. And during that walkabout where not only was Chief Finner there, but also some other HPD officers, there was a shooting. Like that was the wildest part, Joy, is that on the night where he's going around, there was a shooting. And I think they also took a bunch of guns off the street with and issued some citations as well. So do y'all feel safer now with more presence in the area? For that one night, I mean, we felt safer with that one night. But um, you know, it, it remains to be seen that this continues. If I, I think we know that police presence is a deterrent. When people please see police cars, they know that that you know the area is being monitored. So if this can continue on a regular basis, I think it will definitely have an impact on the crime that we're seeing. And and I also want to say that these are not just uh, ordinary shootings. These are shootings with assault rifles. I had neighbors who had bullets that were li- literally, you know, inches long and it's unacceptable. And so we do hope that um Troy Finner is a man of his word. I think it's incredible how just one business or a series of businesses can bring in violence like that to a community. Uh, I, I used to live right over there on Holman Street. And, you know, just some nights you would hear just gunshots ringing out, knowing that the next day you'd be reading terrible headlines. So I'm glad that the police are focusing on that. And I hope that they really rely on the sort of hot spot policing that we know works. Hey, Joy, with the nightclubs and bars that are in the area, I was curious to ask a resident about this. Just how bad does it get with the noise? You know, on the weekends, I know it's going to be bad, but during the weekdays, is it bad as well? It hasn't been so much. I mean, we had one thing with one of those pedal party 
things that, you know, people get on. And, and that, that created a whole lot of noise during the day because they would start day parties at noon on Wednesday or even on Sunday around 11. And that created a whole lot of noise in the neighborhood. They have moved across on Blodgett, uh, but still, you know, on, on early evenings on Fridays, you're likely to see two or three of those and a lot of noise. The clubs do produce a lot of noise. Um, people in the street, so, yeah, noise is, is also a, a big issue. You know, we're definitely going to be keeping tabs on this story to see what happens if that presence does help your neighborhood. And I'm so glad you joined us to talk about this because this is a huge story. Evan, how about you? What was your big story of the week? The big story this week is that Anise Parker is back in politics. She is potentially throwing her hat in the ring to challenge Lena Hidalgo for county judge in 2026. I think this is big news because we're used to seeing Texas Republicans get in their own civil wars. Think of your George P. Bush versus Ken Paxton. But Anise Parker is basically setting out to be a Democratic George P., the moderate challenger who's going to take on the partisan incumbent who's been dogged by controversy. So I am excited to see this happen. And I think it's a real sign that the Democrats are holding on to power in Harris County because if they didn't have power, they wouldn't be fighting over it. Yeah, this was surprising to see that, you know, she is going to be throwing her hat in the race potentially in 2026. So, I mean, like, where did this come from out of nowhere? I mean, it's not that far out of nowhere if you keep your ear to the ground. Parker gets along really well with the Republican predecessor, Ed Emmett. The two are actually planning on teaching a class together at Rice. And East Parker didn't endorse Lena Hidalgo in a reelection race. Uh, and so I think that Parker just looks at Lena as a candidate, as an incumbent who you know, isn't doing a good job, doesn't know what she's doing. And Parker could come in, quell some of the controversy and just do a better job as the county's chief executive. You know, it is wild when you hear Republicans say those things about Lena Hidalgo, you go, oh, that's so wrong. But when your own party is kind of hinting at it, it just creates so much drama, so much tension, and it's going to make for an interesting race for sure. Absolutely. You know, a few weeks ago, Lena Hidalgo went out and gave a press conference about problems in the way that the county did its budgets and spent money. They didn't have proper paper trails. People weren't disclosing conflicts of interest. And she was right. But just Because of the way that she runs that office, she hasn't been able to build any coalition around her to support change. So I think that's a problem that Anise Parker is really hammered on, even when Lena Hidalgo is right. She can't do anything about it. But I have to say, I think what's going to happen is that if the two of them go head to head, they're going to end up splitting the white vote, paving the way for a black candidate to win. So congrats to future county judge Christian Manifi or Amanda Edwards. Ooh, wow. Okay. Hey, just remind listeners, what has former Mayor Parker been up to? Uh, Mayor Parker has been leading the Victory Fund, which is a a national political activist group uh, that tries to get LGBTQ candidates elected all across the country. It'd be interesting to see how this all plays out. I I do think that um, a lot of the criticism of Lena Hidalgo is warranted, and a lot of it is um, just kind of a pile-on effect. I I actually retweeted one of our stories, main stories, about uh, Lena Hidalgo a couple of weeks ago, and I got pounced on by a number of people who called me all kinds of names because I just retweeted the story. So it's interesting to see this whole dynamic. I am curious now that you bring up uh, Evan, uh, Kristen Manaphy and Amanda Edwards. Interesting. You know, you've got to keep your eye on the long game there. And these are people who are ambitious and they could do a good job. Joy, I'm glad you brought that up because it seems like people aren't allowed to even retweet criticism, right? Like, are we not allowed to expect more from our politicians anymore? That's been a rising trend where Even if you say the smallest point of criticism, people get upset. Oh, absolutely. And and I also think people don't read well. And I say that (laughs) because I retweeted a story that was on our homepage at the Houston Chronicle. And it was not my story. You know, we often as reporters, we share each other's story. And one person who had a gazillion followers, um, she attacked me as if I wrote the story. And I I responded. I said, that wasn't my story. She apologized. But by that time, all of her thousands of followers piled on top. And it just it's like, yo, this is interesting how this dynamic works. You know, 
It's like, even if it is your story, criticism is okay. We can expect more from elected officials. It's okay, everyone. Like, come on. It's okay to ask for a little bit more. Absolutely. Okay, my biggest story comes from Kennedy Sessions. She wrote this in the Houston Chronicle, a talented reporter. The Houston Federation of Teachers, the Teachers Union, announced this week that it passed a resolution calling for Mike Miles' removal and several points outlining their frustrations in the almost year since the state appointed leadership was assigned to take over the district operations. Now, the resolution states, quote, the takeover of Houston ISD, the largest school district in Texas and the eighth largest district in the country is a politically motivated, irresponsible experiment that is worsening inequities and disenfranchising Houston voters. Houston ISD teachers and support staff have come together now to call for a vote of no confidence in state-installed Superintendent Mike Miles. We kind of knew this was going to happen. They were not happy, the teachers' union, with Mike Miles and all the changes he was making, but they are making it official. Uh, Evan, what do you think happens with this? I mean, I'm curious to see what anyone can do against Mike Miles. He's been appointed by the state. He's untouchable. But it's been so frustrating to see him turn the whole system upside down with little attention paid to what the outcomes are going to be. I mean, all the focus on outcomes, outcomes, outcomes. Show me the outcomes. It doesn't seem like he's actually accomplishing anything. As a journalist and as a parent with two children in HISD schools, I am extremely concerned and been very frustrated with um how everything has been playing out and how it has even increased the disparity between schools even more. I I think personally what he's doing is is um, running our schools into the ground. But as a journalist, I, I, I take a different approach. But as a parent, it is really hard to watch this and really hard to have your, your kids in, in a school system that, you know, is not uh, really looking at the best interests of their education and, and how they can really thrive. I keep going back to this because every time we talk about Mike Miles, I feel like his communication skills are just not up to par because so much of this could have been avoided if he just listened to the union a little bit more about what they wanted and listened more to students and parents about what they wanted instead of just coming in and saying, this is my way and we're going to do it this way. And that is it. That's how we're going to fix this problem. All you had to do was just be a little bit, a little bit more receptive to what the uh, other parties in this district want it in terms of change. And he didn't do that. I agree. And, and I also think that he lacks a level of compassion. This is a very emotional um, time in our education system coming out of out of COVID. And we're seeing children struggle and in many different ways. And I know that HISD was in trouble before Mike Miles took over. We know that there were there were uh, budget disparities and they would know that there were issues with um, um, overspending and not, you know, all this stuff. We knew that that was a problem and he inherited a big uh, job, but his approach and his communication style uh, have made it uh, extremely hard for him to be effective to me. I mean, he could have just focused on the schools that really needed help. And instead, he's been poking at the entire massive HISD system uh, and it's hurting the schools that needed help. It's hurting the schools that were excellent. It's hurting everyone. And I just don't understand it. Houston's original neighborhood downtown is for everyone and it's poppin'. It's our open-hearted home for our biggest celebrations and our treasured hidden gems. From the world-class theater district to incredible green spaces like Discovery Green, downtown is the place to be. In fact, more people visited downtown Houston last year than the entire population of Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, and San Antonio combined. There's no better time to live downtown than now. From starter apartments to luxury lofts, everyone can take Take advantage of the arts, business, culture, entertainment, food, and recreation. Now, you might think of downtown as only the heartbeat of Houston's regional economy, which it is, but there's so much more to it, including free events throughout the week with Downtown Houston Plus. From the Market Square Park Farmer's Market every Saturday to Yoga Flow every Wednesday, you can find something to do and eat and watch in Downtown Houston. Learn more at downtownhouston.org. Down Downtown Houston. Get energized and revived. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. 
Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. All right, let's get to our most overlooked stories for the week. Joy, kick it off. Most overlooked. Well, you know, this might be important to me. I don't know how important it is to everyone else. But Express has announced that it was um, going into bankruptcy. Now, if you have shopped at any mall in the last 20 years, you know, Express has always been a staple for stores, for for young, trendy wear. Um, it's usually your starter w- wardrobe for uh, your job. Yes. Or you could also go get your club wear there. You can get your boyfriend's sweater in college. It was it, it has been an icon in, in a many ways when it started in the 1980s. Houston only has, I believe, about three stores left. So the fact that they are closing um, a hundredth of stores nationwide. It's almost like an end of an era, end of the mall shopping, the trendy mall store for young people. That is it right there. It's the end of mall shopping. I don't think there's a better way to put it than that, Joy. And Express definitely was the place to be. Like I can remember going in and buying my first dress shirt that fit just perfect, right? And you're going to work, you feel good. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, fashion that was affordable because it was always on sale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Express, come on, just mark it down. I mean, you don't have to have sales every single day, but it was that. It made uh, fashion accessible for everyone. Absolutely. No, my closet is filled with old Express shirts in bright colors that for whatever (laughs) reason, when I was in college, I thought looked good. And so where am I going to go now when I just need like an eye squintingly bright blue button down shirt ever again? I don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. I think my sizing is a little off for Express now. At this, I, I moved in more, to more mature sizing now, but <laughs> Express was my store, was my go to. It was definitely entry level fashion. I still have shirts too, Evan, for whatever reason. I can't throw away my Express shirts. I never wear them. My wife gets mad at me. She's like, can you please just go ahead and donate this shirt? You're never going to wear it. It doesn't fit correctly. Why do you still have it? But it's just like nostalgia, right? Like I remember saving up to buy that shirt when I first got a job in Houston and I don't want to get rid of that shirt. And I, you know, every once in a while I'll put it on and I'll immediately take it off because it does not look good. If someone starts playing some Little John and gives me some hair gel, I'll need a shirt to wear. And that's what the Express shirt is for. Joy, what was your favorite outfit from Express that you bought? Oh God, I don't know what I, I, I how, how much time do you have? I had, yeah. <laughs> I think when I was starting out in my early, early 20s back then, you know, it was mini skirts. So you had to wear your suit, but your skirt was really short too. And everything, I, I just, uh, I, I don't know what I didn't have from Express. Express always reminds me of this meme that I saw on social media about why were people in the 2000s going to the club in business casual wear? <laughs> yeah, like why? We would always dress up like we have an interview. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you, I was one of them. Me too. I mean, and basically you would go and you had your, your suit on and it was a pinstripe suit. I remember this was, I got it from Express because I got three pieces, the ch- pants, the skirt and the jacket and it was brown pinstripe suit. And it, it had a nice fit and I would go to work and then we'd go to happy hour and happy hour kind of stretched into dance night. So yeah, it's fun. For sure. For sure. RIP Express. Thank you so much for the memories and all the shopping moments here around the city of Houston. Evan, what was your most overlooked story? Most overlooked story is that today is the Vision Zero Houston convening in downtown Houston at Majestic Metro. I think this is a critically important convening because Houston is one of the most, if not the most, dangerous big cities to drive in. I mean, Texas sees 12 people die every day on our streets and roads. In 2021, the last year when we had good data, we had 330 people dying in cars on Houston streets. And we have this political energy that gets riled up behind reducing homicides and murders. But there's no passion behind reducing road deaths, which are also tragic, which also we could be preventing. So I will be there. I'll be interviewing Megan Kimball on her new book, City Limits, which investigates the harms inflicted by freeways. 
Commissioner Leslie Briones will be speaking. Sheriff Ed Gonzalez will be there. And I think all of this is more important because right now, Mayor Whitmire is flip-flopping on some road safety projects that were launched by the prior administration. Locking Shepherd Project, which he once supported, undoing a lot of prior promises to prioritize safer street designs. I mean, it's incredible to see what's happening there. And I just hope that whatever conversations happen at Vision Zero Texas are able to change some hearts and minds. Evan, you mentioned it, Mayor Whitmire and everything that's going on, the tension that is there. How much is that going to be brought up today? It's definitely going to be in the air, even if nobody says a word about it. It's going to be on everyone's minds. I wasn't familiar with this, Evan. So thank you for bringing that up. And I agree that, you know, we have to pay attention to what's going on here. And um, road safety has to be paramount. We hear about too many fatalities in, in the news, and it's just unacceptable along with the crime that's happening. So I'm glad that you are um, involved in that. And I'm, I'm looking forward to finding out more. By the way, Monday's episode, we're going to be focusing on road rage, a little little related, not related, really, but uh, just want to bring that up. We're going to be talking about that as well regarding uh, all the shootings that have been happening. And by the way, Houston was the worst city for road rage shootings. So we're going to talk about that on Monday. Just want to put that programming note out there as well. My most overlooked story of the week, and I'm interested to hear from both of you, Are y'all ready to pay for a garbage collection fee because city council approved paying for a study that could recommend a monthly garbage fee? And that study is going to look more into the waste department and what they are doing correctly, how they can improve. And yes, the monthly garbage fee. And this comes from Matt Sledge from the Houston Landing. So before I give you more details, tell me, Evan, Joy, are y'all cool with paying a little bit uh, for the garbage? Oh, a hundred percent. Yes. I mean, first of all, I'm in I'm in West U. So, you know, what happens in Houston stays in Houston. But Houston is the only major city in Texas that doesn't have a garbage fee. The funds are fungible. So if you're able to pay for solid waste, it means you can pay for other things with the funds you already have, such as the firefighters you only got coming through, such as increasing the number of law enforcement agents we've got on the ground. So I think it's about time that you found the revenue streams our city needs to actually pay for all the stuff we're already doing. I'm conflicted on this one. Um, at personally, I say yes, and I agree with Evan on everything he said. But there's so many people who will be, who are being squeezed left and right um, with the, the increases on the rate of water, property taxes. Um, time you look around, there's something that is new that is being um, it, it increased in a way. And I just, I think this is, it might squeeze a lot of people. I, on the flip side, I do hope that it helps with some of these things about illegal dumping, maybe that might help bring more additional revenue to help, you know, tidy up some of the neighborhoods that really are are, are struggling with that. So one thing I want to add from the story, um, Matt writes this in 2019, council members overwhelmingly rejected the idea of a twenty seven dollar monthly fee. The next year, consultants helped Solid Waste craft a proposal for a twenty dollar to twenty five dollar service fee, which went nowhere under former mayor Sylvester Turner. So this is something that has been proposed before and just hasn't really gone through. But this time it might have to, because as you mentioned, Evan, the budget, you got the firefighters deal as well. And here's one more piece uh, about the public opinion regarding all this. Uh, Public opinion polling suggests that there may be, you know, a little wiggle room because about two thirds of residents are willing to pay a $10 or more monthly fee. But when it gets to about $20, not as many are down for that. So yeah, we're the only major city that doesn't have it. I'm out in the suburbs and Frankly, the HOA just bakes that fee into our annual HOA dues. So like, I know I'm paying for it. It's just easier to swallow, I guess, because it's just an annual fee. I mean, you have to pay for services one way or another. And the tax system we have right now isn't covering everything. So we just got to do it. And, you know, it takes Nixon to go to China. If there's anyone out there who can get people to raise taxes, it may be Mayor Whitmire. Could be. All right, let's get to our moment of joy. Joy, you kick us off. I love this segment. (laughs) It's all about joy. Well, did anyone have noticed over the weekend, Charles Barkley and Shaquille O'Neal got into a um, a, a riff about Galveston? Yeah. So, Joy, it was right after the Pelicans went down 3-0 in their series and they've been eliminated since then. 
But basically, right, in sports, you go, all right, off to Cancun you go because you just lost a series. Well, they played so badly that Charles was like, no, you know what? They don't even get to go to Cancun. They've got to go to Galveston to the dirty waters, basically. And he went on to use ex- expletives and, call- and kept referring to Galveston in the dirty water and Galveston in the dirty water. And Miss Tina, uh, Beyonce's mom, who is a native of Galveston, took offense and basically schooled him on social media, on in- her Instagram post about Galveston, that she was born on the island and it is a, a wonderful place. And so I wrote uh, a column about my love for Galveston, which has been has run deep since I was a little girl. I even shot a commercial uh, about 10 years ago for the Love Galveston campaign that the uh, Tourism Bureau w- had done. And what he doesn't know is that it's really not dirty water. It is It is because the water's warm. There's a mix of the soil and sand, and it causes this appearance of it being dirty. Uh, but Charles needs to get his facts correct. I'm with you, Joy. I also, you know, shared our episode about why Galveston doesn't suck. I love the island. I love going there in the summer. It's a lot of fun. The beach is obviously a big part of it, but there's just so much to do. The people are always so nice and it's a beach. Come on, people. It is great. And we do get blue water. Okay. Every once in a while, I retweeted my video of the blue water that, you know, I always put it out because people need to understand that we do get blue water here in Galveston. So it's all good. It's fun. But yes, I, you know what? I remember that commercial, by the way, Joy. So I love it. And yes, I'm glad you're also defending our beloved Galveston. Absolutely. Evan, what was your moment of joy? My moment of joy is that Texas Monthly uh, allowed me to rant in their pages about why I hate the crepe myrtle, the worst tree. It's awful. And it is apparently the Texas state shrub, which it does not deserve to be. Okay, the crepe myrtle does not deserve to be the official shrub of Texas because one, it's not a shrub. All right. It's a tree. Just look at it. It's a dang tree. Anyways, it was just I really appreciate them letting me do this. Uh, please go read it. It's on their website. And then write your state representatives and state senators and tell them that a more appropriate state shrub would be the Texas Lantana. There you go. That is the most Evan story right there, Evan. <laughs> I like crepe myrtles. I just want to say I like them. I really do. Cleaning Beautiful. up after them where they shed and all the flowers fall down in like the I hottest day of August. That they are beautiful. When you see the purple and white and all the beautiful colors. Oh, come on. I just, I, I love great myrtles. They can and be beautiful. They can their... be beautiful if you know how to maintain them. But most people, they do crepe murder. They just chop the top. Crepe murder, he said. Crepe murder. <laughs> oh, I'm going to remember that one. Oh my gosh, that is awesome. I've linked that, by the way, in our show notes, along with all of the stories. I want to get to my moment of joy before we get out of here. And I hosted the SciFair ISD Audio Visual Production Media Awards yesterday, and it was amazing to see just how talented the kids in SciFair are when it comes to production, newscast, podcast, original music. So many amazing things are being done in SciFair ISD, but it was also fascinating to see, you know, with all the great things that are happening with this program, the district just announced that they're cutting their librarian staff in half as they face a budget deficit that is 38 million, could be a little bit more. We don't know. They actually had a meeting Thursday about it and things are getting a little tense there. So, you know, with all the great stuff that is being done, I just hope that these great programs are not impacted by the budget shortfalls that are occurring, it seems like, at every single district. So just want to throw that out there. But it was a blast seeing all the students and seeing all their great work. All right, that will do it for today. That was so much fun. Joy, thank you so much for joining us. Evan, you as well. And we will talk to you down the road. Thank you. Chat with you all next time. That was Joy Sewing and Evan Mintz. You can read all of Joy's work along with all of the stories we discuss with the links in our show notes. That will do it for this week here on CityCast Houston. Our producers are Carly on Jones and Joyce Tang. Our newsletter editor is Brooke Lewis and the host is me, Raheel Ramzanali. Our music is by the band All the Kimonos. We'll be back on Monday with a look at why road rage is up in the city and how you can calm yourself down on the roads. 
Thank you for listening, and I hope you learned something new. Do you know where your voicemail app is located? Yeah. On- of course. Mm-hmm. <laughs>